to Morris Snow Christian Church. Everybody that is here, there's like 10 people here in this building at the moment, but hopefully a lot more of you out there all over um, Kingston and Tennessee. Um, today we're going to be um, continuing our mini series on peace that passes understanding. Um, and today we're going to be kind of diving in a little bit deeper, talking about the relational aspect of that. How, unless we're close to Jesus, there is just no real hope of us ever really grasping that peace. Um, it all comes from him. Um, we can search all over for it, but we'll never find it unless we are in relationship with Jesus. Um, and so that's what we're going to be talking about. And that's what we're going to be singing about. So um, please feel free to sing along. And everybody that's here, if you could stand up, we'll get started.
never stop working Even when I don't see it, you're working Even when I don't feel it, you're working You never stop, you never stop working You never stop, you never stop working Even when I don't see it, you're working Even when I don't feel it, you're working You never stop, you never stop working You never stop Good morning. As we uh, as we approach the table this morning, uh, as we get ready for 
uh, partaking in communion. Uh, if, if you think about the world that we're living in right now, it, it seems like every, every side is throwing out all of these reasons of why we're divided and not why we're separate and why we shouldn't like this side for this reason and why we shouldn't be over here for this reason. Uh, we've been going through this series uh, with the students called What If? And the idea in this is we're, we're asking the question, what if we took the scriptures, uh, what if we took Jesus at his word, if, what if we took what God said seriously? And when we look in our world, we see all of this division, we see all of these uh, reasons why one person shouldn't like the other, and uh, all of these reasons to fight and to battle. But if, when we look through scripture, Jesus calls out his people to be different. In John chapter 17, uh, Jesus prays. He says, my prayer for them, uh, my prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one. And Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, in them and you and me. May they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians, uh, when he's talking about uh, communion in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, or chapter 10, I'm sorry, uh, verse 16, says, is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ. And it's not the, ble the bread that we break, a participation in the body of Christ. Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one loaf. Never before uh, has there been as much of an important time for us to remember that we as the body of Christ, as believers, are called to be one. That we are united not because of our political ideology, not because of our geographical location, not because of anything else other than the name of Jesus Christ. So as we take part in communion, as we uh, participate in Christ's sacrifice for us in a, in a time of remembering what he's already done for us, let us remember also that he calls us to be one not to be divided by anything else, not to let anything in the world drag us away from uh, God, but also not to drag us away from each other, but to be united under one name, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Uh, Father, we thank you that you called us to unity under your name. We thank you for the salvation that you offered because of the sacrifice of your son. We thank you for paying the price that we could never pay. Lord, as we approach the table, as we approach you, we ask that you would humble, ourself, uh, humble ourselves in knowing that it's all about you. Lord, unite us in your name and for your glory, for your purposes. In the name of Jesus, amen.
opportunity to participate in worship uh, by giving back uh, part of what God has blessed us with. Uh, we, we don't often think of it as a worship, but it is an opportunity for us to participate in what God is doing through his kingdom. Uh, if, you, um, if you look through scripture, there is calls for us to participate in that. There's calls for us to give our tithe. And so I'm going to pray over our tithes and offerings. Uh, Jesus, thank you for the blessings that you give us. Thank you for uh, the chance that we get to be a part of what you're doing and a part of the work of your kingdom, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.
listening to your word. Um, I pray that you will speak to us and you will change our hearts and that we will draw near to you. In your name I pray. Amen. Thank you, guys. Well, good morning and once again, welcome to Morrison Hill Christian Church. Uh, this is the second week in a row. We've had a very intentionally small group here, but I'm thankful for all of you, and we're so thankful for everybody who is joining us online this morning. Looking forward to uh, getting back to primarily on-site and also online hybrid next week. Uh, but thank you to everyone who's part of this whole process. We appreciate it very much. Today is the second part of a two-part message on the peace that passes understanding. If you are an English-speaking Christian, you have probably heard that phrase all your life. If you have had a journey with Christ, a personal relationship with Jesus Christ for any time at all, you've probably experienced this whether you knew it or not. But this is something that's available for all of us, but in my personal experience and in my experience helping other people through their faith journey, it seems like that very few of us actually experience this to the level that Jesus would like us to, to the level that Jesus has made it possible for us to experience it. That uh, all these promises have to do with every area of our life, and for some reason we don't, experience, we don't even try to experience it in every area of our life as much as we should. So these two weeks together we've been focusing on how to do that. And one more time, there are two basic kinds of peace that thread their way throughout all the scriptures. They, they overlap, there's a lot of uh, blending between the two, they're not entirely separate, but there are two distinct ideas that we see very clearly. One is an internal, vertical kind of peace. It, it's based on complete trust in God. And it's your personal sense of peace, of strength, of confidence, of perseverance, of your ability to persevere when it makes no sense. Your ability to focus and do what needs to happen just because of your relationship with God, your total trust in Him. The other kind of peace that the scriptures describe a lot is more horizontal, it's more external. And that has to do with the peace that we are, let, we are able to experience with other Christians within the body of Christ to a level that the rest of the world just can't even understand. And also the kind of peace that we are supposed to spread collectively throughout the world. The, the kind of peace that the kingdom of God is supposed to radiate and to spread throughout. This pattern, just like the two kinds of peace, uh, threads throughout the scriptures. There's always a, a vertical and internal kind of application to what God calls us to do. And also an external and horizontal application. Even the cross itself. I don't know if you can see it behind me or not, but the, even the cross itself has a vertical and a horizontal. I don't believe that that was a complete accident. But let's go on through as, as we go. Uh, we're going to just look at a couple of verses we looked at last week and then keep on through where we're going today. Colossians 3.15, Paul writes, And let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. For as memory, members of one body you are called to live in peace. Now, once again, we see both kinds in the same verse. It's, it's both things happening at once. 2 Thessalonians 3.16 Now may the Lord of peace himself give you his peace at all times and in every situation. The Lord be with you all. And once again, we see that this peace is primarily there because of God's presence in us, his Holy Spirit in us, his ability to hear our prayers, his deep passion to speak into our lives and to be with us in the midst of whatever suffering we are facing. This past week, I experienced this. There was, again, a very small group of people here. Some of you are the ones who were there, and you could vouch for this. This is probably a little too transparent, if anything, but I was really wrestling with this myself. On top of all the other things that uh, we were being forced to kind of go back primarily online again and all the stress involved in that right in the middle of it here comes Noah going we've lost the signal and at that moment I'm telling you everything everything in me was done if you saw me wandering around on the stage muttering I promise you I wasn't cursing at Comcast or anything like that I promise you but I was wrestling I was uh, inside my heart I was praying and there were some fears, and there were some doubts, and there were some, some anger, and there was some frustration and all of that. But I was in real time t 
turning down the volume on those things and turning up the volume on this peace that passes understanding because I knew that God could do that. And that's the only way we were able to go ahead and finish the message on Facebook and later re-record it. The only way I, 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 part of me, the human part of me, the just John Pryor without the Holy Spirit's part of me, just wanted to walk out the door and say, forget it. But God gave us a piece of passage understanding. We got through it. And we heard later that several people actually got something out of that message, even though a lot of people missed it or gave up halfway through. Righteousness and justice is this other kind of peace. It's the kind of peace that really affects. It's where we encourage and build each other up. 2 Corinthians 13, 11 says, Dear brothers and sisters, I close my letter with these last words. Be joyful. Grow to maturity. Encourage each other. Live in harmony and peace. And then the God of love and peace will be with you. Once again, we see God doing all the heavy lifting. God himself and his presence and everything that he has done through Christ, the Holy Spirit in our lives. That's where all the power is. But again, as always, he leaves the choices up to us. We do these things and then we will experience his peace. And I experienced this this past week. Not only did uh, we somehow make it through, but God's people reached out and even encouraged us. They, uh, on Facebook and uh, some personal messages, text messages, phone calls. I even got a card from a wonderful woman in our church who hasn't been here for a while because she's scared of, 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 of getting sick. And she was encouraging me. I, it just absolutely blew my mind. But that's the kind of peace the external, the horizontal kind of peace that God's family does. And I love that. One more passage we looked at last time, and this is part of where we get this phrase, this concept of peace that passes understanding, is from Philippians 4, verses 4 through 9. And I'm going to actually use that passage today as the outline of, of what we're going to walk through. But not because I just love it so much or, or whatever, but because it, it sounds so beautiful, it sounds so noble, it almost sounds like poetry. But these are practical marching orders that Paul is giving us. He's writing these words from prison. He's personally experiencing that vertical, that personal, that internal peace. But he's also spreading this peace out and, and still telling God's people, this is how you do it. This is how you make this happen. Let's walk through this together. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. So the big first idea here is to rejoice in the Lord always. And I, I know people sometimes make fun of us when we go back to the original Greek and all that, but I can tell you that the word rejoice means celebrate. It means actually be happy. And some of you guys have, have experienced this before in situations. For example, you probably, I know you have, you've had somebody's birthday come up right when a huge bill, unexpected bill happened. But somehow you still had a cake or you still sang songs or you did, somehow you still made it. Or you had Christmas or, or Easter or Thanksgiving happen right after someone in your family died or some huge tragedy happened. And nobody was really in the mood. Nobody really felt like, hey, let's just have a party. That's what I really feel like doing. But somehow you remembered in that moment that Jesus being born is still worth celebrating no matter what. That somehow that Jesus dying and coming back to life is always worth celebrating and always worth living out. That somehow or another, there's always something to be thankful for. And you were able to rejoice, literally rejoice, always. And the Greek word we translate always means always. That's what it means. It means all the time, no matter the circumstances, we are able to celebrate because of this peace. Jesus Christ himself said, John 16 33 and Jesus said in John 16 33 I have told you all this so that you may have peace in me here on earth you will have many trials and sorrows but take heart because I have overcome the world we can't fully understand we can't fully explain this peace but we can understand it when we put our trust in God and when we humbly practice the justice and mercy and love that he told us to practice among ourselves and intentionally spreading it out to the people around us. 
This phrase, the Lord is near, is so beautiful. I love what Paul's doing here. It's, it's a subtle thing. On one level, he's just saying, God is actually near to you. You have the Holy Spirit in you. He's in the New Testament era, and he's, noticed, he's saying Jesus is coming back. But at the same time, he's using a phrase that was familiar to people who had grown up reading the Old Testament. Because throughout the Old Testament, you see this phrase, the Lord is near, and another phrase, the day of the Lord is near, over and over and over. Here are two examples just to prove that I'm not making this up. Psalm 145, verse 18 says, the Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. And Obadiah 1.15 says, the day of the Lord is near for all nations. As you have done, it will be done to you, your deeds will return upon your own head. And so Paul is calling back to this, but he's saying, hey, you know what? Jesus is fulfilling all this perfectly. And now, not only is God listening to our prayers, but we have the Holy Spirit in us. He's as near as he could possibly be. And Jesus Christ coming back is this ultimate day of the Lord. We now know what this is. The final fulfillment of the day of the Lord is our Lord and Savior coming back. And it's coming. And it's closer than we think. It's closer than it feels. And so we can take peace and hope in that. The second thing Paul tells us to do is to not be anxious, but to present our request to God. Do not be anxious. Present your request to God. Here's the verse, Philippians 4, 6. Do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. It's simple, but hard, right? It's, 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 it doesn't take a lot of explaining what he means here, but it's, it's real. He's saying that our trust in God has always got to be the loudest volume that we are listening to. It's always got to be bigger. We've got to choose to trust him more than we fear other things, more than we doubt, more than we question. He, he's not forbidding us to do those things. He's not pretending that there won't be hard times in this, in this life. He's telling us straight up we will. But in all situations, with prayer, with petition, with thanksgiving, we can come to God. He told the church in Romans, be joyful in hope, be patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Again, they are joyful as they wait. Hope is not when everything shows up, it's, it's while you're waiting. It, it, they're patient, not just waiting on something good to happen, but in the midst of something really bad happening right now. They are faithful in prayer the entire time. Jesus said, can any one of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? It was a rhetorical question, by the way. He knew the answer was no. In fact, worry makes it worse. And medical science and psychological science and other things have pretty much confirmed it actually shortens your life. If you choose to constantly stress out about things, to live in fear, the loudest voice you're listening to is what you're afraid of, what you're worried about, what you're concerned about, what you're angry about. It actually shortens your life. It doesn't lengthen it. And it messes up. It ruins the life that you do have, however long that is. But when we listen to the loudest voice being his whisper inside of us, when we crank the volume up on that, when we mute the other stuff, that's when we actually start to experience something that the rest of the world can't even imagine. We can't even explain or fully understand. Jesus goes on in this wonderful passage, Matthew chapter 6. If you haven't read the whole thing, you need to. It's wonderful. Matthew chapter 6, verses 33 to 34. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. My friend Lou recently gave me a really wonderful life hack. I'd like to share that with you this morning. If you're listening today, Lou, thank you, by the way. But he said many years ago, somebody came to him and asked him about his to-do list and said, when do you do the first thing on your list? And he said, the first. And they said, good job. When do you do the second? 
He said, well, second. And they said, no, that's, that's where you're wrong. He was confused. I was confused. You're probably confused. Here's the bottom line of this wonderful life hack. He said, in the time that it takes for you to focus and get that first thing done, the world has shifted a little bit. When you're done with that first thing, you need to stop and, and look around and go, is the second thing on my list still the most important? Maybe there's something even more important than what even on my list in the first place that now needs to be the first thing. And so you do the next first thing. And when you do that next first thing, just like the first one, nothing else matters. You're focused on getting that thing done. You're not worrying about the other ones. You're getting that done. And when that's done, you look at your list again and you listen and you see what's shifted in the world and you say, what's the next first thing? And you move on. So practical, so easy, so much like what Jesus is telling us to do here. Philippians 4, 7 is the exact verse where we get this phrase. Uh, by the way, today I'm reading all of the verses from the NIV just to keep things say, uh, simple and um, be able to acknowledge the copyrights and everything. But in Philippians 4, 7, it says this, The peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. As a church, one of the truths we come back to over and over is that God guides and provides when we trust and obey. God guides and provides when we trust and obey. This means that all the provision, all the power, all that everything comes from Him, and yet we must choose day after day, moment by moment, to live those days and those moments in light of eternity. We must choose to live in light of eternity, not just in light of this life that we live. And that's where this peace comes from. That's where God steps in and he's physically with us somehow in ways that we can't explain. He is listening to our prayers. He is with us when our hearts are broken. He is healing us. He is offering real solutions. And it's not just an internal and a vertical thing. It's an external and a horizontal thing. And that's where we're going to go in these last few moments as we start to exp figure out what does God want us to do about this this morning. I'd like to take you deeper into the peace that's external, the peace that is horizontal, the peace that his people who are experiencing this vertical and internal peace are supposed to radiate, are supposed to team up and to, and to spread throughout the world. So we're going to go back to a phrase from the first couple verses there. Let your gentleness be evident to all. Gentleness is an interesting word. It, it, it sounds like fear. I know when my boys were little, we had four boys that were all pretty small at the same time. And everywhere we went, we were honestly a little bit afraid that they would break something. They were very, very capable of break some, breaking things. I promise you, they had the power. They had everything that they needed at their disposal to destroy just about any place that we took them. And so me and, and especially my wife, Kimberly, were always going, hey, guys, be careful. Let's, let's be, be, be gentle. Don't touch that. Don't touch that without asking. Don't, don't touch anything without asking. This was, a, this was a way of life for us, and I'm sure we weren't the only parents who experienced this. And so gentleness sometimes has this idea of fear associated with, but it's really not like that. It's really a lot more like when I was first holding each one of them. And I'm not that big of a guy, I'm not that strong of a guy, but in that moment I just knew that if I, if I did anything wrong at all, I could really hurt them. Because I was so much bigger and so much stronger than they were in that moment. And I had to be careful. Gentleness is only possible, listen, gentleness is only possible from a position of strength. You don't need to be gentle if you're incapable of hurting someone else. You don't need to be gentle unless you've got that. And here's the thing. If somebody in the room has confidence, has peace that passes understanding that nobody else is even, can even grasp, that's a little scary. That's a little intimidating. So what, we're, what God is saying here, I believe, is we've got to be gentle. We've got to remember that there's always somebody watching. There's always somebody watching how we react to things. There's always people listening to what we say. There's always people watching what God's people do with and to each other. And there's always watching what we do and even what we don't do 
to spread his peace and his love throughout the world. That's always happening. And we've got to act carefully about that. We have incredible power at our disposal. We have disposal, sorry. We have incredible power at our disposal. We have access to the power of God himself. The peace that passes understanding. And for some reason, sometimes, sometimes way too often, we paint a picture that looks like we don't. We've got to be more gentle than that. We've got to acknowledge the strength that we have and use that strength carefully and intentionally. Philippians 4, 8. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Don't get distracted by the less weighty things either. I recently listened to a wonderful message from Pastor Eric Mason. I really like him. He's the author of Woke Church, one of my favorite modern books. And he's also a really great pastor. I really respect him a lot. He's got a great message. It's on Right Now Media right now. Uh, and if you, you should, as members of Morrison Hill, you have access to that. Just go through our website. You can get that. I recommend that message highly. But in the middle of that, he references what Jesus said in Matthew 23, 23. And he points out Jesus' very intentional wordplay here. He said, Jesus says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites! For you pay tithes of mint and dill and cumin, and you have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. You should practice these without neglecting the lighter matters. We don't use that word woe very much anymore. That's kind of an outdated word. It was common back in the day, and Jesus, the idea people knew what it was. Eric Mason's definition of it is the best I've ever heard, honestly, for modern ears. He says that Jesus saying woe to you is like your mom using your full government name and saying you have one more chance to act the fool. And that, I think that's really what, that's, that's perfect. That's so perfect. I love that. But Jesus is reminding them, hey, you're spending so much time measuring out these little tiny things, 10%, making sure you're giving exactly 10% of your spices. It's not about the 10% measurement. It's about trust. The idea of tithes and first fruits and offerings to God, it's not about that he needs exactly 10%. It's, it's about that he wants us to trust him that we acknowledge that everything that we have comes from him and so we give back to him the first portion and then we figure out what to do with the rest and expect him to bless us in that that's a heavy truth that's a big deal and jesus is saying you want it's even heavier than that god provides for you so that you can make a difference in this world the reason that you are trusting him, the reason you are doing this, the reason you are building his kingdom is so that you can build justice and mercy and faithfulness, this external and horizontal kind of peace in the world. Your king, the kingdom of God is to be creating those things. Which leads us to Paul's fourth and big idea in these couple of verses. He says, whatever you've learned, put it into practice. Here's how he said it. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. Jesus himself again said, God blesses those who work for peace. Some translations say peacemakers or peace creators. It's this idea that we will be called the children of God because we are doing what God does. God creates order out of chaos. God takes things that are broken and makes something beautiful. God takes something that is separate and makes it whole. God takes people who could never get along and somehow unites them around something they didn't even know existed before. That's what God does. And when we are peacemakers, Jesus said, God blesses those who work for peace for they will be called the children of God. I was speaking to another one of my friends this week uh, and just about some of the things that happened this week. Some of the decisions that got made and 
some of the different things going on in our world today. And he pointed out to me, Jeff pointed out to me, Isaiah 59 could be describing exactly where we are right now. This message was almost completely complete, but I've got to I've got to throw that in there and I want you to look up Isaiah 59 later on today. Isaiah 59. It describes a world where people have forgotten God and therefore they don't even know what justice means anymore. They're fighting over things they don't understand. They're trying to create justice. They're trying to demand justice, and nobody even knows what that is. Nobody on any side of any of the arguments even knows what this is anymore because we've gotten so far off track. And why are we so far off track? Because God's people are not getting the peace out there like they need to be. The hope of this world is not the government. It's not the, the anybody else except God himself working through his people. We're supposed to be living out a peace that exceeds anything that we or anybody else could ever understand. And without us doing that, without us doing, putting into practice what God has called us to do, the whole world looks like Isaiah 59 all the time. And when we do it, it starts to look a little bit different. Pastor Mason says that all reconciliation starts with tension. That may sound like a, well, duh, kind of a statement, but he means something more than what it looks like on the surface. Of course it starts with tension. There's nothing to resolve, to reconcile, if there's no tension. But that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about the tension of, so what do we do about it? The tension of, so what's the best thing? How do we create peace? What do we do to work to create peace in this moment? There's a tension there. What, what, I, don't, I don't know. What do we do? You've got to pray. You've got to think. You've got to work together with the rest of the people in the body of Christ. You've got to have access to everybody who is hearing from the Holy Spirit in all the different ways that he empowers us. You've got to somehow, as a body, be listening and working together and uniting on purpose around the things that we know to be true, no matter what else we are confused about. And we've got to focus on things, and we've got to actually take action. I love the example that his church set in this. He describes this in this same message, and it just it shook me. I really encourage you to go listen to that message as well. But he said that at some point where he lives in Philadelphia... Within a couple of months, two things happened in, in, in his community. One was that local government cut funding to education by over $400,000. And then just a couple months later, increased funding to prisons by over $500,000. We could call this a whole bunch of different things. Systemic racism, a whole bunch of different things. The, I, don't, I wasn't there. I don't know the people involved. What I love is how they responded. They didn't, instead of just assuming that they knew all the answers, instead of burning down the courthouse or some action like that, here's what they did. They secured a bunch of computers and they started opening specific training sessions for kids in their church. They started teaching kids how to do computer coding and graphic arts, and a bunch of other things that gave them hope and actual skills and abilities to get a whole bunch of jobs they never even dreamed about. That's what a church does. Morrison Hill is actually looking into several ways to do similar things right now, and I'd appreciate your prayers in that because our, our community is going online every Friday on schools now, and there's a bunch of people who don't have access to Wi-Fi. We're trying to do some things like that, but here's the point. The solution is not offering Wi-Fi. The solution is not offering computers. The solution is this. When you see a problem, when you see injustice, when you see something that no matter who did it and how they meant it, instead of just raging against it, you do something about it, you change it. You even the playing field for the people who are marginalized, the people who are being, their, their hope is being taken away, their opportunities are being taken away. You fix that. To make peace is not just to feel peaceful. It's to create better systems. It's to create better opportunities. It's to stand up as the people of God and saying, we're not going to settle 
for a world that is not just, where nobody even knows what justice and mercy and faithfulness even looks like anymore. We know. We don't fully understand it, but we know. We experience it. And we're, we know that we could experience it more if we jump in with both feet and we fully trust our God and we fully work together to create peace in this world. His church acknowledged the problem. They acknowledged the fears and the questions and the doubts, the anger, the hurt feelings in their community. They acknowledged what was true about all of those. They didn't argue. They didn't try to pretend that it wasn't as bad as it was. But here's what they focused on. They focused on what was true, what was noble, what was right, what was pure, what was lovely, what was admirable and excellent and praiseworthy. And they used the strength that God himself gave them to do something about it. They helped those who had been shoved aside, those who felt rejected, those who were rejected. They helped all of them and they fixed something together. They created connections. They created hope. They welcomed people into their family who would never have even considered being part of that family before. This morning, I'd love to challenge each of you to do one of four things, actually all four of these. But I believe that there's no point in me standing here talking to you ever and not having something to do about it. You don't need to listen to me or anybody else, but you need to hear from God. And that's always my prayer is that you hear from him when I speak to you. And you need to act on it when you hear from God. And that's always my prayer is that you actually act on it. So this morning, I'd love for you to finish this prayer in this way. Lord, I will. Lord, I will. You make a statement. Lord, I will do this. Here, here's, here's the first thing I'd like you to do. Try. Try to do this. Pray, pray for God's peace. Pray for help. Pray for wisdom. Talk to other people. Take action. If you already, if there's something you know that needs to be done and you've just been back coming, just jump in. Just try it. Just try. Listen. You don't know all the answers? Great. Ask some questions and listen. Listen to some people you haven't listened to for a while. Listen to some voices that you probably disagree with about a lot of things. But listen, really listen. Try and hear what they're really saying. Listen for their heart, not just their words. Don't just wait for your turn. Really listen. Model this piece. Figure out some ways to show people in your life. Know that they're already watching, they're already listening, and show them what it looks like to experience God's peace, his internal, his vertical peace, and his external, his horizontal peace. Show them what that looks like. And when you know somebody else who's fighting, somebody else who they, they just can't, whether it's your community, whether it's two people you love, two people in your family, two people you know, two people or two families or groups in your church, whatever it is, if you know that there's a need for peace, work to create it. Mediate. Get in the middle. Work as God's children to create order out of chaos. Beauty out of brokenness. I don't know what the first step is for each one of you, but I'm inviting you to take the first step this morning. And it's amazing how God works. We already had somebody join the church this morning before we started the service over the telephone. That's never happened before. Talk more about that in a moment when we say thank you to God for that during the prayer time. But God is still doing stuff. Brothers and sisters, God is still doing stuff, but he wants to do more. And normally, I would invite you to come forward if you want to. Sometimes people come, sometimes they don't. But as always, here's what I'm asking you. Whether you're at home or you're here, I'm inviting you, please, to make a choice to do this. Make a choice to actually try, to actually intentionally follow Jesus and be a peacemaker. To work together more than we ever have before. To not just experience it, but to share it. And to do that intentionally. We're going to sing together. We're going to wrap up in a few moments with a blessing and several other things. But just now, would you make that choice as we sing this song?
We've been uh, really challenged with these messages about uh, peace that passes understanding. Uh, it's something that uh, I think everyone in this uh, country right now is really looking for, in fact, throughout the world. But I want to talk to us about uh, our own individual battles with this. Uh, we say we want peace. And, and I think one of the one of the marks of our maturity can be sort of like uh, what's the knee-jerk reaction in our life when we face things that would disrupt our peace? Uh, usually it's worry. Usually it's complain. Uh, usually it's, you know, just think about it, get all depressed and upset and more worry. And that just doesn't work. The knee-jerk reaction that we want, though, is prayer. In nothing, be anxious. And then it goes on, you know, but, you know, in everything, with your prayers and your petition with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. I think we all struggle with this, and, and I, I think that, uh, you know, even sometimes I get so wrapped up in what I'm doing, what I want to do, I start, get started, and all of a sudden the, the Lord just reminds me, uh, you left me out. You didn't pray first. Uh, you need to go in this with me. Th this is one of the ways that we practice his presence is we invite him into every area of our life, everything that we face, whether it's a stressful thing, a disappointing thing, a tragic thing, uh, something that's disturbing our peace. What's our first knee-jerk reaction? We need to invite the Lord into that and say, Lord, be, be a part of this with me. I, I want peace. Now, we can want it, but it doesn't just come through wanting it. You got to really want it, enough to work for it, make a plan, start really uh, just disciplining yourself, you know, to practice this thing. Pray first. Get the Lord in there with you with all of these things. And I, I challenge you to do that uh, for everything because if he's in it, it's going to be more fruitful. If he's in it, it's going to be more peaceful. You're going to know he's in control. Uh, he's right here with me. What do I have to fear? Lord's here. You know, Lord's got this. And we need to face all of our situations in this way. We had a prayer request called in this morning. Uh, Jenny Clark called and said that her aunt passed away this morning. And she wanted us to be praying for her parents who will be handling uh, the situation there, uh, all of the arrangements. And then Jenny also has a very dear friend who just discovered she has cancer. Uh, she'll be having a PET scan to determine where they go, how, how they go forward with this. And uh, she, we asked her, do you want this on the air? Because this goes out, she says, yes, please. Uh, if you will, include this in your live stream service so that we can get more people praying. And then I want to remind you to pray for that list that we insert in the bulletin each Sunday. Uh, these are important people. The requests are very important. And they're calling upon us to stand with them in prayer. Let's go to God in prayer. Father in heaven, we, we just have to say so many times, sorry, I forgot, tried to handle it on my own, thought I was capable, and then we get reminded that we're not, and we need you. Father, let this be a really strong discipline in our lives, to pray, to pray first, get you in the situation with us so that we can have that peace, so we can have the guidance so that we can have the power, so we can have the fruitfulness for what you have given us to do. 
But Father, we pray for uh, also for Jenny and uh, her family as they mourn the loss of Jenny's aunt. Pray for them as they make all of the preparations. We join them in giving thanks that her aunt was a Christian and uh, they can have a lot of joy in knowing that struggles are over. Father, for her friend that is facing a battle with cancer, I pray that you will use this to strengthen her faith and use it for your glory as you draw her near to you and encourage her to bring me into this situation so that I can walk with you through this trial. Father, in all of these things and in those that we have in our list to pray for each week, Father, work for your glory in their situation. Work to where as prayer is answered, everyone knows it was you, it was your power. And that's how the prayer was answered. But Father, as they wait upon you, may they learn that your grace is sufficient, that your strength is made perfect in weakness. May this be a time of spiritual growth for them and a time that will strengthen their faith and deepen their love for you as they look to you. Father, all of these things we pray for in your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. So all of our uh, groups are continuing. Uh, most of them are virtual this week. Uh, so we encourage you to check with your small group leader, uh, check with your Sunday school teacher, check with your class uh, to get all the details of how to do that. Uh, for our children's ministry, GLOW will be on Zoom at 1030 this morning uh, and also uh, tonight and Wednesday night at 6 p.m. on Zoom. Uh, the marriage ministry uh, Zoom class will be tonight at 7 p.m. Uh, with Rod and Judy Coker leading that. Uh, for, the, for the teenagers, for our youth ministry, uh, we will have an Instagram live tonight at 6 o'clock. Uh, we will have uh, Sunday school, uh, Right Now Media, watching the next session, which is session 9 uh, in Francis Chan's uh, Book of James series, and then your Zoom groups at 1045. Uh, this Wednesday, we'll be meeting in the parking lot for youth group. Uh, check our social media for all of the details on that. No, someone to officially, is this on? Yeah, it's on. Can't hear it though. Is this muted? Okay. Sorry about that. I'd also like to officially welcome the Jones family to our church. Uh, William and Sindel and their four boys. Uh, they're the ones who officially joined this morning uh, uh, with over the telephone. Again, a brand new thing. They're just, uh, uh, it, it's amazing that God still moves in all these cool ways. We're very thankful and welcome to our family. Uh, as, as, uh, as you all return next week, we invite you to get to know them even better. They've been part of our church family for quite some time. The, today, we're gonna wrap up again with a blessing. If you would, uh, put your hands out like this wherever you are and, and, and catch it. If that's not meaningful to you or feels weird, please don't. I just want you to receive this in every sense of the word. This is Hebrews 13, 20. Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, that great shepherd of the sheep, may he equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. We love you.